Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Mary Claire Kennedy and I've seen many of you for the last few months. So thank you for joining us again for our webinar this evening. Uh, we appreciate you joining us this evening because I understand it's a, it's a nice evening in most parts of the country. So hopefully you will find this um, a very informative and helpful webinar for your practice. So the topic for this evening's webinar is men and cancer in Ireland. And we have a multidisciplinary team of speakers here to, uh, to deliver the content this evening. Um, so in terms of who we have speaking this evening, um, we have Redmond Lyons, who's a senior pharmacist with the National Cancer Control Programme. We have Dr. Heather Burns, specialist in public health medicine in the National Cancer Control Programme, and Dr. Una Kennedy, general practitioner and GP advisor with the National Cancer Control Programme. So in terms of, of how it will work, the speakers, each of the speakers will uh, deliver a segment of the presentation in turn, and then at the end, we will take questions. Um, there's a little bit of content to move through this evening, so I think it's best if we can hold the questions till the end. Um, you're very welcome to post questions into the chat function, which you can see if you hover over your screen just to the very bottom. If you have a question and you, you don't think you'll remember it, please do type it in there and we'll come back to it at the end. So as usual with these webinars, webinars, um, we've muted everyone's microphones. Um, and if you're having difficulty uh, with your, your sound or your video, the best thing to do is, is to leave and, and come back and you'll be admitted back into the room. As I mentioned, we'll accept questions through the chat function. And we've also shared a pre-session um, set of questions prior to this webinar this evening to inform the content. And so thank you for completing that. And we might also follow up on those questions towards the end to see um, in terms of how our learning and understanding of the subject has, has um, progressed. The webinar is recorded and the content will be posted onto the IOP website in the coming days. And we will share a feedback survey at the end also um, to, to understand um, your experience of this webinar this evening and content you'd like to see in the future. So without further ado, then I will hand over to Redmond, who will um, take us away in the first part. Just bear with us um, between speakers, if you don't mind, as we just get the, the slides uploaded. There's always that, that uh, few seconds of, of pause, but um, we'll get started in a moment. Thanks. So I'll, I'll thank you, Redmond. I'll, I'll uh, turn off my mic now. Thanks. Thanks, Mary Claire. Um, so what I'm going to discuss today is the pharmacological treatment of prostate cancer um, how it's been evolving over the last number of years and I will also highlight the resources that are available in order to assist pharmacists when they encounter the drugs in both the community and hospital setting. So if we could just move on to the first slide there. So just a brief overview of prostate cancer first of all. Um, it's an androgen driven malignancy that develops in the prostate meaning that testosterone plays a role in the overproduction of cells in the community. So the most common cancer men with over three and a half new cases every year. Um, and so a, a word on some of the common treatments then, there, there are three main options. First of all, we have surgery. Uh, this could be in the form of either surgical castration or radical prostatectomy. So surgical castration is the, it's the removal of the nipples and the aim of this approach would be to lower the levels of androgens in the body in order to slow down the progression of the disease. And then as regards the radical prostatectomy, this is the removal of either part of or all of the prostate gland and um, with the aim of removing as much of the tumour as, as possible. Then another common type of treatment would be radiotherapy and um, this could be used with or without other treatment types depending on the cancer. It can also be used at different stages of the disease and it, it's often intended to be, to be curative and um, however there can be side effects to contend with such as um, the likes of urinary or, or bowel issues. And then finally, we have the systemic anti-cancer treatments or SACT for, for short. One of the most common forms of systemic treatment is androgen deprivation therapy, which is also known as ADT. So this group of drugs form, they form the backbone of many treatment regimens um, for prostate cancer and they act to reduce levels of androgens in the body. Um, and this is a term known as uh, um, And these would be some of the drugs you commonly see in the community pharmacy settings, such as bicalutamide, which is a tablet, or the likes of tryptorellin, which is uh, an injectable implant. And um, then traditional chemotherapy, that's also still used, but it started to become superseded by some newer treatment options, which have less side effects and more favorable efficacy results. 
And so docetaxel will be the most common drug here for the most common chemotherapy for, for prostate cancer. Then finally, we come to some of the newer treatments. Um, one of these groups are known as the new hormonal agent or NHAs for short. Um, there's a number of these that act at various stages in the disease pathway and are at various stages of the HSE assessment process. And I will yeah, I'll, I'll use in more detail later on. And then finally, the newest class of drug come on the radar to cancer are what are known as the PARP inhibitors. And there's one drug from this class um, called Alaparib, which some of you may actually already be familiar with used in ovarian cancer. It's currently in the HSE assessment process for prostate cancer. And I suppose noteworthy for Alaparib is that it requires a positive BRCA test prior to being initiated. So if we can just move on to the next slide there. So on this slide, I just want to cover some of the terminology that's used to describe some of the different stages of the, of the disease, as I'll be discussing the progression of the disease in detail in the slide after this one. So first of all, the term biochemical recurrence. This is where patients have received treatment for localized or locally advanced prostate cancer, but they are now experiencing rising levels of prostate serum antigen, which is PSA. Um, and this is a signal that the cancer is now likely to progress. And then the next four terms are where things get slightly more confusing. Uh, to know these are a couple of times over the years, but these are the current terms used. So the easiest way to think about it is that you have non-metastatic and metastatic stages of the disease. And then with each of those, within each of those settings, the patient's disease is further subdivided in terms of how their disease responds to treatment with ADT. So looking first at the non-metastatic setting, we have two stages. First of all, there's non-metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. So these patients are termed hormone-sensitive as they still respond to or are sensitive to androgen low therapy. And then there's also non-metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer. So these patients are known as castrate-resistant as they no longer respond to androgen low therapy. Then we also have the same to the same two stages in the metastatic setting. So you have metastatic hormone sensitive and metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. And again, these are characterized by whether or not the patient responds to it. So if we can just move on to the next slide there. This next slide shows a high level overview of the main ways that prostate cancer can progress. But the majority of patients with prostate cancer are diagnosed or locally advanced disease. And this stage is actually often asymptomatic and will commonly be picked up during routine health checks. So for instance, a raised PSA level during a, a, a GP visit. Um, but once the patients then treated for localized or locally advanced disease, they will experience biochemical recurrence, which I mentioned in the last slide. And from here, there are three possible disease progression pathways. If we look at the top half, we can see the patients can progress first of all to metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. So this is where the cancer is not spread and they're still responding to ADT. And from here they can progress to metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer, a stage where the cancer has spread but it's still responding to ADT. And the next step here is progression to metastatic castrate resistant cancer. And this is the terminal stage of disease and associated with poor survival and severe symptoms with a median overall survival of less than 19 months once the stage is reached. So then if we look at the bottom pathway, some patients can initially progress to non-metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer. So this is where cancer is not spread, but it does not respond to ADT. From here, they progress to castrate-resistant prostate cancer with poor doses, as I've already outlined. Um, and then finally, if you look at the middle pathway, it's also possible for patients to progress directly to metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer from the bio biochemical recurrent stage. And then I just wanted to mention um, the evolving treatment options for prostate cancer. Um, so traditionally, patients will be prescribed ADT in the non-metastatic setting with chemotherapy or NHAs being used in the metastatic setting. Now, however, we're starting to see new hormonal agents becoming approved in the non-metastatic setting in order to prevent progression of the disease to the metastatic stages, which have very poor prognosis still. Um, it should be noted here that, however, that um, 
the current advice only recommends for NHAs to be used at one stage in the pathway. So if an NHA is used in the non-metastatic setting, that means the patient won't have the option to use any other NHA at any other stage of the disease. So if we could just move on to the next slide. Again. So here I just wanted to go through the currently HSC reimbursed indications for hormonal agents. But two of the more recent approvals were in the non-metastatic setting with Appalachian Heritage and White Bird being reimbursed for the treatment of adult men with non-static castrate-resistant prostate cancer who are at high risk of developing metastatic disease. So as I mentioned previously, these drugs are now being prescribed earlier on in the disease in order to prevent progression to the metastatic stage where the survival rates are much lower. So then in the metastatic setting, we have enzalutamide and abiraterone, which is used in combination with prednisolone or prednisone. So these two have been approved for quite a number of years for, for the same two indications. So the first indication is in men with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer who have either no symptoms or mild symptoms after failing ADT, but where chemotherapy has not become uh, indicated. And then the second indication is where patients with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer have had hospital therapy, but now reversed. Um, and another thing just to be aware of here is that of these NHAs listed here, they're also licensed by the EMA and other indications in prostate cancer with quite a number of these going through the HSE assessment process currently. So it's just to highlight that there's a lot of movement in the space at the moment and it will continue to evolve. So if we could just move next slide. So here I just wanted to highlight some of the resources that are available on the NCCB, NCCB website. Um, some of you may be familiar with the NCCP National Chemotherapy Regimen already. Just to note, each of the chemotherapy drugs you might encounter will have a published regimen available online in order to support the safe and effective use of the drug. So they're split into the relevant tumor group with the prostate regimens. They come under the genital urinary heading, which is the screenshot on the left hand side here. Um, I've also included a screenshot on the right of the oral anti cancer medicines page, which should be useful for those in community pharmacy, as it will provide the full list of regimens for currently reimbursed oral, reimbursed oral therapies. And just a note as well, there's, other, there's also other useful resources on the website. So the NCCP have their um, anti diabetic guidelines, and there's actually also a dedicated community pharmacy resource page, which also has a lot of uh, useful information. So if we just move on to the next slide there. So yeah, just to conclude then, um, so we've seen the drug treatment path pathway in prostate cancer. It's, it's greatly expanded in the past 10 years with numerous new drugs um, or indications still in the assessment process. Um, and yeah, just to highlight again, the shift in the approach so through the days of drug therapy for prostate cancer would have consisted of ADT in the early setting, followed by chemotherapy in the metastatic setting. But now with new drugs becoming available, we're seeing the likes of new hormonal hormonal agents can use both in the early and metastatic settings along with the upcoming targeted ther therapy option in a lap that becomes approved for reimbursement. So this of course means that going forward we'll have a much wider prevention for some of the dominant male cancers. That's great, thanks so much Redmond. Um, so I'll just share my slides now. Um, perfect. There we go. Okay, great. Um, so good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Heather Burns, and I'm a specialist in public health medicine working in the Cancer Control Programme. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about cancer in men, primarily cancer prevention. So just to start with a little bit about the National Cancer Control Programme. So the NCCP was established in 2007 following the publication of the second National Cancer Strategy for Ireland in 2006. And that strategy recommended that we have a more kind of structured, programmatic approach to cancer control in Ireland. So hence the formation of the NCCP. And the aim of the NCCP is to deliver comprehensive cancer care to patients across the disease continuum. So from prevention and diagnosis to treatment and survivorship. We take a whole population approach and a key part of our role is also to monitor and evaluate publicly delivered cancer services. The NCCP is the lead agency with responsibility for delivering many of the recommendations of our current national cancer strategy. And the vision of that strategy is that together we will strive to prevent cancer and work to improve the treatment, health and well-being experiences and outcomes of people living with and beyond cancer in Ireland. 
So there are four overarching goals of the National Cancer Strategy. So they're around reducing the cancer burden through prevention and risk reduction, providing optimal care, maximizing patient involvement, and ensuring an enabling change. And so I'm gonna to focus today on the first of those goals. So reducing cancer incidence in Ireland. So why is cancer risk reduction important? Well, it's very important because we know that at population level, between 30 and 50% of cancers are potentially preventable through changes to lifestyle and environmental factors. We also know that cancer prevention provides the most cost-effective long-term approach to cancer control. And for these reasons, prevention is highlighted as a cornerstone of our current national cancer strategy. And the National Cancer Registry published a report in 2019 looking at cancer incidence projections for Ireland to the year 2045, and it showed some, some pretty uh, sobering figures. So it showed that if the risk of getting cancer in Ireland doesn't change, we're looking at an approximate doubling of cancer incidence between 2015 and 2045. So this graph shows the figures for men. So currently every year in men in Ireland, there's approximately 12,850 new invasive cancers diagnosed, and that, that excludes non-melanoma skin cancer. So about 12,850 per year at the moment, but by 2045, that's set to approximately double to 24,000 160. And if we think that between 30% and 50% of cancers are preventable, you can see why we need sustained commitment to these upstream interventions to try to prevent cancer, because we simply cannot treat our way out of the cancer problem. So if we look at, at the most common cancers affecting men in Ireland, um, as Redmond said, the most commonly diagnosed cancer in men is prostate cancer. It accounts for almost approximately one in three newly diagnosed cancer cases in men followed by colorectal and lung cancer, each accounting for approximately one in eight new cancer cases in men. And then melanoma of the skin is the fourth most commonly diagnosed cancer. The picture is a bit different when we look at, at what is causing cancer death in men. So the leading cause of cancer death in men in Ireland is lung cancer. You can see there it causes 22% of cancer deaths. So more than one in five cancer deaths in men are due to lung cancer. And then one in eight cancer deaths is due to colorectal and the same again due to prostate cancer followed by esophageal, which causes 6% of cancer deaths in men. So if you think about the kind of modifiable factors that can increase cancer risk, there's some of them that we'll, we will all be very familiar with, like um, smoking, alcohol, and others like overweight and obesity, um, our diet, um, and sun exposure. So there are many different factors that can increase a person's cancer risk. And we have a really solid evidence base for that. There's lots of evidence, there's lots of research. We have the World Cancer Report. We have the International Agency for Research on Cancer, and they look at all of the available evidence. And then they can group uh, factors as being carcinogenic to humans or probably or possibly carcinogenic or not classifiable. So as I say, we really have a lot of research to, to base our kind of cancer prevention interventions on. And in Ireland, then we do have again our own research. So the National Cancer Registry published this report on modifiable risk factors and cancer in Ireland. So this is a 2020 report and it shows that 29% of cancers in Ireland are due to 11 modifiable risk factors. And that estimate of 29% is quite a conservative estimate. It's probably a higher proportion than that, but at least kind of almost one in three cancers in Ireland are due to these 11 modifiable risk factors. And you can see smoking is is leading the league table there. Oh, I'm getting some feedback. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Grant. Um, so smoking um, causes 13% of, of cancer cases in Ireland, and that is followed then by overweight and obesity, which causes 5%. So one in 20 newly diagnosed cancers in Ireland is attributable to overweight and obesity, followed then by infection, alcohol intake and sunburn. And you can see the other factors there that cause preventable cancers in Ireland. So if you think about the, the common cancers in men then, as I said previously, colorectal cancer, it causes one in eight newly diagnosed cancer cases in men and one in eight cancer deaths in men. And we know that a number of factors increase any man's risk of colorectal cancer. And these factors include smoking, alcohol consumption, excess body weight, and eating red and processed meat. So conversely, in order to reduce risk, you just need to um, av avoid um, tobacco, reduce or avoid alcohol consumption, try to take measures to maintain a healthy body weight uh, and try to avoid red and processed meat and eat whole grains and fibers. 
Now, this is all very, uh, it's easy to say, you know, these are the, are the modifiable risk factors and we can all take action. But obviously, um, you know, there's, there's also a need for government action on these things and to create healthy environments and make the healthy choice the easy choice for individuals. So as well as having an informed population who know what they can do to reduce their risk, we also need measures like legislation. So things like the smoking ban and um, the public health alcohol bill, these kind of things that can really help support individuals to lead healthier lifestyles. In terms of lung cancer then, as I said, it causes one in eight new cancer cases in men and more than one in five cancer deaths in men. Um, and we will all be aware of the link between smoking and lung cancer. So smoking is associated with between 70 and 80% of lung cancers. Radon exposure is another important factor, which has been kind of very prominent in the news lately with the publication of the new, the new Environmental Protection Agency radon maps. And also risk of lung cancer can be increased through environmental and, and occupational exposure to certain substances like asbestos or coal or certain compounds in paints. So again, to reduce risk, quitting smoking is the most important measure that anybody can take. We can also check radon levels in our home and take action to remediate if we are exposed to radon and also follow occupational health guidelines in the workplace. In terms of skin cancer then, we know that melanoma accounts for 4% of newly diagnosed cancers in men and non-melanoma skin cancer obviously accounts for, for a significant pro proportion of incident cancer cases. And at this time of year, we, we will hopefully all be aware of the SunSmart campaign. We're really trying to ramp up communications on that. The, N the NCCP leads on delivery of um, the skin cancer prevention plan. So hopefully you will have all seen messaging around um, skin cancer prevention. And as pharmacists, I'm sure you'll have plenty of, of people coming in looking for sunscreen, looking for advice on what sunscreen to wear. And I think it's very important to add the message that it's not sunscreen on its own, it's sunscreen screen and additional measures like clothing, wide brimmed hat, shade and sunglasses. So really the whole kind of spectrum of protection is very important to reduce our risk um, of skin cancer. And then in terms of esophageal cancer, so this is the fourth most common cause of cancer death in men, causing 6% of cancer deaths in men. And risk is increased by smoking and alcohol intake. And so risk can be reduced by avoiding tobacco and reducing or avoiding alcohol intake. And then in terms of prostate cancer, it's obviously a very important cancer because it is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in men, accounting for approximately one in three new cases, and it causes one in eight cancer deaths in men. But prostate cancer is interesting because there isn't really very good evidence around modifiable risk factors for prostate cancer. The main risks for prostate, prostate cancer are things like advancing age, ethnicity, and genetics. So your kind of non-modifiable risk factors are things that you can't change. But there is some evidence that factors related to obesity are associated with unfavorable outcomes in men diagnosed with prostate cancer. And so I think it's always a good message that maintaining a healthy body weight and being physically active and eating a healthy diet, it's good for your health in any case, and it may help to reduce your risk of prostate cancer, even though kind of a solid evidence base for a causal association there is, is lacking. So I'm going to speak a little bit more now about the risk factors, oncogenic mechanisms and what kind of risk reduction support is available to men and to people in the community. So in terms of tobacco, um, these, these statistics are from the most recent um, iteration of the Healthy Ireland survey, so in 2021. And if you look there to the right of the figure, the 2021 figures, we still have 18% of the population in Ireland smoking and the proportion of men that smoke is higher than women. So you can see that there are 20%. So one in five men in Ireland are still smoking. Smoking causes cancer at 15 different sites in the human body. It has obviously a different proportional impact um, at different sites. It causes approximately 76% of lung cancers, 67% of laryngeal cancers, and one in two bladder cancers are caused by smoking. And if we look at the population attributable fraction, smoking causes a higher proportion of cancer in men than in women. And that may be attributable to things like the higher smoking prevalence in men. But we know that in men in Ireland, smoking causes approximately 14 and a half percent of cancer cases in men in Ireland. So really um, a significant proportion. In terms of the oncogenic mechanism, then we'll be aware that cigarette smoke contains lots of chemicals, including approximately 69 carcinogens. Um, it causes DNA damage and it also makes it harder for cells to repair their DNA damage. And accumulation of DNA damage in the same cell over time can then lead to the development of cancer. And even smoking a small amount of cigarettes a day or smoking occasionally increases your risk. And the more years that a person has smoked for and the more cigarettes they've smoked, the higher the risk of cancer. So that dose response relationship. 
And to reduce risk, obviously the best defense is not to start using tobacco and there's no safe level for smoking. The more years a person smokes and the more cigarettes they smoke, the greater the risk. But no matter what age somebody is, it's never too late to stop smoking. And the health benefits of quitting start right away. And there's lots of um, interesting um, information that you can signpost people to. And I think people like to see kind of what are the benefits. So this is available um, on, the, on the We Can Quit website. It talks about the health benefits of stopping smoking, what happens after 20 minutes. You know, So after just 20 minutes, your circulation will improve. After eight hours, nicotine and carbon monoxide levels go down. After 48 hours, um, you know, nicotine and carbon monoxide have left your body and all the way out to 15 years when your risk of having a heart attack is the same as a non-smoker. And so I, I think those kind of timelines are very interesting to people. They can really help motivate them. And there's apps available that can help people to track their progress and see see what kind of progress they're making there's lots of su support available so the hse tobacco free ireland program it provides and promotes a wide range of stop smoking services so there are online and social media supports that you can uh, signpost your service users to there's the quit.ie website they can free text quit or or call the helpline and also Ireland's first national stop smoking clinical guideline was recently published and it does set out how healthcare professionals can support people to quit smoking. So um, I, I recommend you, you could have a look at that guideline as well. There's lots of, of high quality and strong evidence in that guideline. Then in terms of overweight and obesity, again, Healthy Ireland statistics, this is around the proportion of people who are actively trying to lose weight and, and it's that dark green figure at the bottom. So 30% so of men in Ireland are, are actively trying to lose weight. And um, overweight and obesity causes cancer. That, again, you can see at many different sites in the human body, including the kidney. So approximately one in four kidney cancers are caused by overweight and obesity, the liver and the gallbladder. And again, if you look at the population attributable fraction, it's slightly different for men and women. So for men, overweight and obesity causes approximately 4% of cancer cases or around 470 cases per year. And how does overweight and obesity cause cancer? Well, it increases inflammation, it changes hormones in our body. So it increases estrogen, increases insulin and increases adipokines. Um, and we do know that overweight and obesity, it's a complex multifactorial disease. So, you know, it's not just a case of eat less, move more. People need to, to try to employ a variety of different mechanisms. And again, we need government support. We need healthy communities. We need active commuting options. We need all the kind of measures in place to support people to make these kind of healthy lifestyle choices. So again, not just eat less, move more, but also um, uh, factors including having enough sleep and minding your mental health can all influence our body weight. And again, there are plenty of supports available. So you can signpost um, service users to the Healthy Eating Active Living Programme. There's lots of tips on getting active and keeping active and local sports partnerships as well. And so all the websites are here and we can share this slide deck with you um, so that you can signpost to these resources. Um, eating for Health, again, plenty of information on that is available, community cooking program signpost and healthy eating guidelines. Sleep, there are again HSE tips on how to, how to get better sleep and sleep hygiene and then mental health resources as well. So as I say, we can provide all, all these links afterwards. In terms of alcohol consumption then, overall two thirds of people in Ireland aged 15 and older report consuming alcohol in, in the previous six months. So again, this is from the Healthy Ireland survey. Men are more likely than women to have drunk alcohol in the previous six months. And men remain more likely than women to binge drink on a typical drinking occasion. So on a typical drinking occasion, more than one in three men who drink alcohol are binge drinking on a typical occasion of drinking. And we know the cancer risk from alcohol, it causes cancer at many different sites in the human body, again, with um, a different proportional impact by site. So approximately one in three pharyngeal cancers are attributable to alcohol, approximately one in three oral cancers, and one in five laryngeal cancers. And again, if we look at the population attributable fraction by gender, it, um, alcohol does cause a slightly higher proportion of cancers in women than men, but it still causes almost 2% of cancers in men or about 218 cases a year. Um, and again, in terms of the oncogenic mechanism and how alcohol causes cancer, alcohol does con contain numerous carcinogenic compounds, particularly ethanol, which breaks down into acetaldehyde, which damages DNA and stops cells from repairing this damage. And it also impairs the body's ability to absorb important nutrients that can protect against cancer. And again, affects, affects um, hormones in the body. And for people who, who drink alcohol and smoke, unfortunately, then the two combined can really greatly increase cancer risk. 
So any type of alcoholic drink can increase your risk of cancer. And again, there's no self le safe level below which alcohol does not damage health. And duration of drinking and age at which a person starts drinking are important determinants of cancer risk. And again, there's lots of supports available for people who want to um, inform themselves more about alcohol, to have a look at the um, low risk guidelines. And they are low risk guidelines because there is there's no um, level of alcohol consumption at which there's no risk. Um, and you can see there, there's tools online again on the HSE website and askaboutalcohol.ie that allow you to calculate how many units are, are in the the alcohol that you're drinking and how much money you've spent on alcohol. So again, factors that might help motivate people um, to reduce their intake. And in terms of UV radiation then, um, this again is Healthy Ireland data and it's looking at the proportion of skin cancers that are caused by a single episode of sunburn and sunbed usage. And you can see in men there, to the left of the, that graph, um, in terms of the proportion of squamous cell carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma and melanoma that's caused by a single episode of sunburn and by sunbed use uh, and its significant proportions of those cancers. Um, we know that men are less likely than women to report using a form of sun protection, so 89% of men versus 96% of women, and they're also less likely to report using each type of sun protection, with the single exception of wearing a hat. And there's large difference between men and women in reported use of sunscreen of factor 30 or higher. So almost eight out of 10 women report using this while in the sun for more than 30 minutes at a time, but only about six out of every 10 men report doing so. So less men using sunscreen. Sunbed usage isn't such a, a big issue and hopefully we'll see legislation around that in the future, but certainly um, sun exposure is a big issue. And if you think of the kind of occupational exposures that men may have around farming or outdoor workers, um, they're at significant risk. So anything that we can do to reduce that risk um, is very welcome. And we know again how, how the sun can cause cancer, it can damage skin cells, um, we know UVA rays cause aging, UVB rays, rays cause burn and that most cases of skin cancer can be prevented by protecting the skin from ultraviolet radiation. So we would advise that people follow Healthy Ireland Sun Smart, the five fives. So, you know, slip on clothing, slop on sunscreen, slap on a wide brimmed hat, seek shade and slide on sunglasses. And we know that the UV index is high from April to September, even when it's cloudy. Um, and no sunscreen can provide 100% protection. So again, it's a combination of all those different measures. And again, there are supports available. As I say, the NCCP leads out on delivering Ireland's skin cancer prevention plan. And there's plenty of resources available on our website. We have some smart partner packs and resources up there. You know, there's posters you can print out um, and lots of information that, that might be useful to you. And so you can see the number of different factors that influence um, our risk of cancer. Um, and for men in particular, there is slightly different risk profile for men versus women. Um, but following each individual recommendation is expected to offer cancer protection benefit, but really the most benefit is gained through an integrated pattern of behaviors relating to diet, physical activity, and other factors. So it's really a package or a way of life. And as I say, as a public health doctor, we are very committed to looking at the broader factors. So yes, individuals can do a lot, but we really do need government, government support, we need healthy public policy and legislation and healthy environments to make the healthy choice the easy choice and support individuals to live the kind of lifestyles that will help them to reduce their cancer risk. So I'll just signpost you finally to our website um, at the bottom there, cancer prevention resources at hse.ie forward slash cancer prevention. And also if you want to subscribe to our Irish Cancer Prevention Network newsletter, you can email us at prevention at cancercontrol.ie. We produce a quarterly newsletter with evidence-based cancer prevention information. So um, as I say, if you want to drop us an email, we'll happily sign you up for that. So thanks very much. And without further ado, I would like to hand you over to my colleague, Una Kennedy, who's going to talk to you about um, early detection of cancer. Great. Thanks, Heather. Thanks very much for that. I'll just try and get my slides up here now. Let me find them. Okay, here's hoping. And hopefully everybody can see that. So yep. we'll kick off. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. So thanks for inviting us here, IELP, and thanks everyone for attending on a lovely evening. And Heather and Redmond, thanks for those fantastic talks. So I'm going to speak about men and cancer in Ireland, and I'm focusing on early detection of cancer in men, how to go about it, what to look out for, and what you can do. We we'll launch straight in, and as Heather said, these are the common male cancers in Ireland, the common invasive male cancers, prostate cancer being the big one, it accounts for about one in three male cancers followed up by colorectal or bowel cancer, 
followed up by lung cancer and followed up by melanoma. Those top four are the ones are going to focus on and they account for almost 60% of all the invasive cancers you will see in men in this country. So those are the big ones we're all looking out for. And the next question is, what do we mean by early detection? What is an early stage cancer? Well, in very broad brush strokes, very broad general terms, cancer is divided into four stages. Stage one being uh, the earliest stage when a cancer is very small. Typically, it's less than two centimetres in size and it's in the organ it has started in. So you imagine a lung cancer, it is two centimetres in size, sitting quietly in the lung and not really causing, causing a whole lot of trouble. Stage two, it's got bigger and typically that means larger than two centimetres in size, but it still remains within the organ. So in the case of lung cancer, it still remains within the lung. Stage three, the tumour is large again, but it has spread to nearby tissues and lymph nodes. So we imagine our lung cancer might have spread up to the lymph nodes in the neck or in the centre of the chest or up under the arm. And in stage four, the tumour has spread to other organs through the blood or lymphatic system, for example, to the brain or to the bones. And I think your intuition would tell you that stage one is far more easy to treat and your survival is going to be far better than at stage four. And your intuition would be dead right. And this is the chart that bears that out. This chart shows the five year survival for those top common cancers by stage of diagnosis. So stage one would be uh, the early stage in green, the green boxes. Stage four is late stage uh, red boxes. And a few things jump out, I think, on this slide. The first thing is that stage one survival for cancer in Ireland for men is actually very good. I mean, it's up in the high 90s uh, for all of them. Melanoma is 99%, testicular cancer is 99%. The other thing that jumps out is that it falls quite dramatically for the most part for stage four cancers. And I think the big one here for me is always bowel cancer. It's 95% survival at stage one and it pretty much collapses to 11% five-year survival at stage four. And the last thing I think that jumps out about this slide is that it's very difficult to improve on 99% or 95%. And I think where the improvement is going to have to come is in moving people out of those red boxes and into the green boxes, stopping people being diagnosed at stage four and getting them to being di diagnosed at stage one or stage two, where at all possible. What are the factors that delay diagnosis? Well, there are patient factors and there are healthcare professional factors and there are health system factors. Some of the patient factors, this was um, an article that was published in 2022 and it's about factors that stop men presenting to GPs. But I think some of it is relevant to pharmacists. They divide into three broad barriers for men, structural barriers. So time of appointments, you can't get appointments, lack of ability, availability of a male GP, and you can imagine even if a gentleman is in a place where he doesn't have access to a male pharmacist, they might just be a little hesitant to approach a female pharmacist, perhaps. And the feminization of practice premises. So I, I know that in our practice, we have female receptionists, we have posters up about breastfeeding and so on. It's not a very masculine environment. And maybe that's something we look at. Maybe that's something that applies also to pharmacies, maybe. There are internal barriers then within men fear, embarrassment, vulnerability, stoicism, and a wish to continue working. Now, stoicism is, lots of the time, it's a, it's a really good quality, but just not when it comes to early diagnosis of cancer, when you do want people to make a fuss and you do want them to complain. Um, they mention in this article that uh, an angle regard to men might be to point out to them that the sooner they're diagnosed, the sooner they're treated, the sooner they're cured, then the sooner they'll get back to work. And that seems to be something that appeals to men. But getting onto this and dealing with it is something that will get you back on the job quicker. And then the issue of self-care and help seeking. Men tended to need prompting to seek medical advice, whereas women seek help immediately. And we think that this is somewhere where pharmacists can come in, because it seems to be the case that men might need a nudge to come and see their doctor, whereas women don't so much. And maybe that's where you as a pharmacist can come in. Maybe you're the person that can give them the nudge to come and get help. We also did some work at the NCCP amongst healthcare professionals about the barriers to early diagnosis of lung cancer. And amongst community pharmacists, a few points were raised. So there was a variation in the service knowledge and use. I mean, some pharmacists weren't fully aware that there were rapid access clinics, for example, to lung cancer. Now, how would they know? It's not something that they would use or refer people to every day. But as that may be, they, they didn't always know that these clinics existed. 
there were concerns about the role and the scope of their practice. And, and you'll all know this better than I will. How far do you go? How far does your role extend? They were aware of the pressures on healthcare professionals themselves and other healthcare professionals and also on the healthcare system. And they didn't want to overburden the healthcare system. And there was also the fear of scaring patients while emphasizing the urgency of referral. And granted, that is certainly a skill, trying to scare people enough that they'll actually seek help, but not so scared that they're incapacitated with fear or frozen with fear. How do you overcome these barriers? And we think that you can. Um, first of all, there's your survey that was done in 2019. This is the most up-to-date one I could find. And the numbers are really staggering. Almost 2.1 million people visited a pharmacy in the last week. There's only 5 million of us in the country. These are incredible figures. You've got incredible reach. The monthly attendance at the pharmacy increases rapidly with age. And this is another fantastic thing when it comes to early diagnosis of cancer, because we know that once you hit the early 50s, your incidence of cancer or your risk of developing cancer starts to rise quite sharply. And these are exactly the people who start attending pharmacists more frequently. So you're seeing these people. And then finally, we have numbers that I think would make a dictator blush. 98% of people would trust the advice and patient care they receive from the pharmacist. Another 98% would value the professional advice they receive from the pharmacist. So you are seeing people, you're seeing the right people, and there's a huge amount of trust out there for their local pharmacists. People hugely trust their pharmacists. So you've got tremendous um, power there, really. And then this is the uh, latest Ipsos MRBI poll. Uh, the veracity index, who do we trust the most? This is from 2021. And the pharmacist, the local pharmacist has topped the poll. I think traditionally it was always nurses who topped this poll, but this year, well, last year, pharmacists have taken over and pharmacists are topping the poll. So you've got tremendous trust. So I think you can rest assured that people are coming to you and they are coming to you ready to listen to you. We move into the cancers then. The first one is prostate cancer. As we said, it uh, affects one in three men in Ireland, our commonest invasive cancer in men. Who's at risk? Well, like all the cancers, almost all of them, older age is the biggest risk factor. 62% occur in men over 65. Ethnicity comes into play. It's more common in black African men than in white men and least common in Asian men. And your family history. If you have a first degree relative with prostate cancer, or if you have a certain mutation like BRCA1, BRCA1 and BRCA2 and some syndromes like Lynch syndrome, that puts you at slightly higher risk. Who gets it? Well, obviously men get it. The median age of diagnosis is 65 to 69 years. However, the median age of death is 80 to 84 years, which is a good 15, or 15 years or so later. I think what's interesting about this is that the life expectancy for men, as far as I can make out, uh, 2018 was 80.5 years. So these men generally live to their life expectancy, which is good. Uh, you can see on the left the map of Ireland there, the dark green bit is the area where there's slightly higher number of cases of prostate cancer. We happen to be looking at the CSO map, the Central Statistics Office map the other day, and it turns out that there's a slightly higher older population in that part of the country. We think that that might be just why there's higher prostate cancer over there. Signs and symptoms, this is where it can get a little tricky. In the early stage of prostate cancer, it doesn't typically cause too many signs or symptoms. You see the little blue spot there that represents a prostate cancer at the outside of the gland, it's not causing any trouble, it mightn't cause you any symptoms. As it gets a bit bigger, you can see the blue spot has got a little bigger, bigger there. It's pressing on the urethra. That's the tube that joins the bladder to the outside world. And it can cause problems with obstruction of urine. So you might find you've urinary frequency where you're passing urine more often. You have nocturia where you're getting up at night time to pass urine. You might have difficulty passing urine or you might have urgency where you're having to make a run for it and go to pass urine straight away. They can all be signs of early prostate cancer, but they can also be signs of benign enlargement of the prostate. At a certain age, benign enlargement of the prostate is entirely normal. It's not malignant and it can give you these symptoms. So it can be difficult to tell what's what. However, if you're passing blood in the semen or urine, that's not a sign of uh, prostate enlargement. That's something that needs to get checked. What happens when people have prostate cancer or are suspected to have prostate cancer? Well, there are eight rapid access clinics for prostate cancer around the country. We have a national prostate cancer referral guideline. You can have a look at it on the website if you wish. And there are KPIs to make sure that these men get seen quickly. So you will be seen quickly if there's a suspicion of prostate cancer. 
prostate cancer screening, I've left this slide blank deliberately because this is quite a controversial subject. At the moment, there is no prostate screening for men in Ireland. The reason for this is not because people don't care about prostate cancer, which I think is often considered to be the case, but that's not the case. It's because it has not been proven definitively to actually work in terms of affecting life expectancy or survival. However, I would say watch this space. Prostate cancer screening is not gone and not forgotten. And I know that there are movements at European level to look at it again. And I think it's only a question of time before somebody somewhere designs a prostate screening program. As yet, there isn't one. However, there is a cancer screening program for cancer in men. It is available to all men between the ages of 60 and 69 in Ireland. It is free of charge and it screens men for a cancer that actually kills more men than prostate cancer. The funny thing about it is that the uptake for this cancer in men is around uh, 35 to 40 percent, about one in three or so men who could avail of this screening program are availing of it. And this is for bowel cancer. Um, you can see the survival rate for bowel cancer here. Stage one, it's 95 percent. Stage four, it's 11 percent. So you really want to be picked up at stage one if you have bowel cancer. Bowel screen is our national screening program for bowel cancer available to all men and women between the ages of 60 and 69. They send this kit out to your home, you do your own screening, you send it back to them, and you could arguably do your screening test without ever leaving the comfort of your own home. Bowel screen, 60% of the cancers they pick up are picked up at stage one and stage two. And remember the difference between being picked up at stage one and stage four. 60% are picked up at stage one and two by bowel screen, whereas overall in Ireland, we just pick up 40% of bowel cancers at stage one or two. For some reason, the uptake amongst men isn't high, it's about 35%. So if you are within the ages of 60 and 69, or if you know somebody in that age group, please, please, please encourage them to uh, attend bowel screen. Uh, it affects people between 60 and 60, 65 and 69, and death, median age of death, 75 to 79. We have this on our website, hse.ie forward slash cancer. It's got a lot of information about the early signs and symptoms of cancer. You could look at it if you wish. It's freely available to everyone to read. However, in a nutshell, this is the symptoms you might be looking for. Rectal bleeding going on for more than six weeks. Change in bowel habit for more than six weeks. Low blood count or low iron. Unexplained or unplanned weight loss. An abdominal or a rectal mass. Strong family history, watch out for family history of bowel disease or a personal prolonged history of inflammatory bowel disease. Lung cancer, which is our single biggest cancer killer. It kills more men than prostate cancer or bowel cancer. Who gets it? Well, the median age of diagnosis is 70 to 74. And unfortunately, survival isn't good for lung cancer. The median age of death is also 70 to 74. And you can see a little dark spot here over Dublin. There's a particularly high incidence of lung cancer in the greater Dublin area. Lung cancer is very difficult to spot early. It's not an easy cancer to spot. And for this reason, we put this slide together. This slide, uh, we hope, will combine the type of person who might get lung cancer uh, together with the type of symptoms you might expect. So the person, men and women, older, over the age of 50, typically exposed to smoke, either directly or passive smoking, typically associated with deprivation and associated with areas with high rate on exposure. The symptoms you're looking for, a constant cough or a changing cough. Clubbing is changes in the fingernails that you get with lung cancer. Appetite loss or unplanned weight loss. A new cough and particularly a cough going on for more than three weeks. Chest pain or shoulder pain. If you're more easily breathless than you would be used to being or if you're really tired or if, so if you happen to have a blood test and you have raised platelets. These are the sort of combinations of signs and symptoms and people that we are looking out for. A word about hemoptysis, coughing up blood, because it always crops up. It is not a common presenting symptom of lung cancer. It only ever occurs in one in five lung cancers, and it only is a first symptom in 5% of lung cancer. And that's important to say because you can't be hanging on for uh, somebody to cough up blood before you think they might have lung cancer. The big presenting symptom is cough. 65% of lung cancers present with cough, just cough. And the National Lung Cancer Referral Guideline advises that you refer somebody for a chest X-ray if they have a cough for longer than three weeks. And I think where this might apply to pharmacists is you've got people coming into you needing repeated doses of steroids or looking for more antibiotics or cough bottles. Cough going on for more than three weeks, they really should be thinking about a chest X-ray. What happens next? Well, if 
they get have their chest x-ray and even if they don't and if somebody thinks that they are likely to have lung cancer or there's a question of it we have eight rapid access lung clinics and there's a direct referral pathway there for people with suspected lung cancer either be it on symptoms or be it on chest x-ray um, and there is rapid access for people where there is this concern about lung cancer so if you do nudge that person to see their GP, be assured that there is a pathway for them. They will get seen quickly. Our last big one is melanoma skin cancer. Um, age of diagnosis, slightly younger, 60 to 64. Age of death, median age of death, 70 to 74. And as Heather was saying, strongly associated with sun exposure. And I think it's borne out in this map of Ireland. Up here in Donegal, where they don't get much sun at all, there's quite a low level of uh, skin cancer, whereas down in the sunny southeast where they are exposed to a bit more sun, there are somewhat higher levels of, lung, of skin cancer down there. This is a busy slide, and apology for this, but it's an interesting thing about melanoma. More women than men in Ireland get melanoma. More men tend to die from melanoma. And the reason for this isn't clear, but it could be that men are more likely to be diagnosed late stage. And if you look here, uh, number of women diagnosed at stage one melanoma. 70.8% of melanoma cases in women are diagnosed at stage one. It's just 57.6% in men. If you go over here to stage four, 1.9% of melanoma cases in women are diagnosed at this late stage. However, a whopping, really whopping 8.2% of melanomas in men are diagnosed at stage four. And even at stage three, we have 5.4% of melanomas in women diagnosed at stage at five at, at stage three, and it's double that, 10.8% in men. This might account for the slightly higher death rate amongst men. Part of this could be that in men, about a third of melanomas occur on the back in men, whereas they tend to occur on the thigh, about a third of the thigh in women. And obviously, if you're wearing a swimsuit or a pair of shorts, it's much easier to see your thigh. It's not so easy to see your own back and you're really depending on somebody else to see it for you and point it out to you. What are you looking for in a melanoma? Well, this is the ABCDE system. Asymmetry, irregular border, two different colours in the lesion, a diameter greater than six millimetres and evolution of the lesion. So this is where the lesion is getting bigger or blacker or uglier or there are other lesions popping up around it. And again, what happens next? Well, there are pigmented lesion clinics around the country. There are about 13 of them, I think, at the last count around Ireland. We have a guideline. Again, anyone can look at it on the website if you wish. There is a pigmented lesion electronic referral form. So if somebody has a, an odd looking mole or a suspicious mole on their skin, they can get referred electronically to a pigmented lesion clinic where they will be seen quickly. And I can imagine during the summer when people will be coming into you, they'll be pulling up their shirt sleeve and showing you a mole and saying, what do you think of that? And if you're concerned, a nudge, remember men need the nudge to go and see their GP. And uh, the last one I'm going to attend to is testicular cancer. It's not a common cancer. We can see here 176 new cases of testicular cancer every year and seven deaths per year in Ireland. However, testicular cancer is really amenable to chemotherapy. It's really amenable to treatment and it takes response to treatment very, very well. Risk factors include an undescended testicle, past history of testicular cancer, abnormal development of the testis, or a family history. And signs and symptoms include a painless swelling or a lump, a change in the shape, increased firmness, a dull ache or pain in the testicles or scrotum, and a feeling of heaviness in the scrotum. Not everybody behaves like they should, and not everybody does the way that behaves the way the textbook says they will. And people will sometimes present with weird and wonderful symptoms. They don't always present with classic symptoms. So these are general symptoms. This is on our website. And these are just general things to look out for. A new lumper bump, changing lumper bump, abnormal bleeding, bleeding be it coughing up blood, vomiting up blood, spitting up blood, blood in the bowels or the urine, abnormal bleeding. A new or changing mole, unexplained weight loss. It's a really hard sign. Unexplained weight loss or unplanned weight loss. Much more tired than you're used to. That cough again more than three weeks, a persistent change in bowel habit, and persistent typically means more than six weeks, and persistent heartburn or indigestion. What happens next? Well, as I say, we have eight cancer centres around the country. We have rapid access for lung, breast, prostate, and we have a referral form and pigmented lesion clinics for suspected melanoma. People can get referred in quickly and seen quickly at those centres. For any more resources, you can find them here at the hsc.ie early detection, hsc.ie forward slash cancer, hsc.ie forward slash sunsmart. 
And we have recently launched our HSE land module on hseland.ie. I believe pharmacists can access it. And there is an early diagnosis of cancer e-learning program there for you as well. There are two modules, there's 30 minutes each. And that's me. Thank you all very much for attending here on such a lovely evening. Thank you so much, Una, and thank you for flagging those resources at the end. That's very helpful. Um, so I think what we might do now, as we have some time, is to uh, work through some questions um, that um, you would have completed prior to attending the webinar, um, and we'll share them with you again. And um, uh, Audrey will pop them up, and we can see um, in terms of what we've learned. So. Um, Audrey, those answers yep, are coming up. Yep, oh, take your time. I just need to relaunch it. I think here we are, relaunch. Thank you. Grant, is that coming up? Yeah, it's coming up. Thank you. Oh, actually, no, I can't. I don't get the um, answer option. Sorry, Audrey. Oh, I think it's because you're a co-host. So. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, the answer's coming in. That's fine. Right, I can show the answers. Great, thank there. you. Okay, so I think everyone got that. Lovely. Let's try the next one. Okay, so there's a question come through. Thank you for that question. We'll we'll take it once we've run through these questions. Thank you. Okay, so I think we've uh, gotten that one there. Um, Una or Heather or Redmond, if you want to comment on any of these answers as they come through, please do. Please do jump in. Yeah, I think the physical activity one could be a little bit confusing. Obviously, physical inactivity, I suppose, increases your risk enough. Yeah. You reduce yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Invasive cancers. Okay, I think we have Great, so prostate cancer is the correct answer. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Cause of the commonest cause of cancer death. <clears throat> Audrey. It's a lung cancer. Thank you. Question five. Thank you, Audrey. So national screening programs for cancer in men.
I don't seem to be getting the answers through for that one. Yeah. Audrey, I'm not sure if you can see them. Let me see. I don't know what's going on. I'll try it again. Okay. Ah, yeah. there we are. It's coming through. Yeah. Great. Um, so Heather, Una, um, do you want to comment on that one, I suppose, in the context of the bile screening programme? I mean, it could be simply people don't know about bile screening and the uptake amongst men isn't great. Right. In fairness, you know, it's not exclusively for men. So it's sort of yes. question you, yeah. Yeah. On it, you know, you have to be fair. Bit of a trick one, yeah, yeah, but yeah. aimed exclusively for men, I suppose, is, yeah, yeah, but it is obviously inclusive of men, yeah, thank you. Uh, shall we uh, try one more um, before we take that question in the chat? I think that might be right. So the comments present a complaint of lung cancer is hemoptosis. And I actually think that was one of my main learning points uh, from this evening. So thank you Una, for flagging that. I had misconstrued it to be a higher proportion would suffer from that in, in my head um, and maybe had put aside how prevalent the cough issue would be. So thank you. That's my main learning point for this evening. Okay, lovely. So um, the question came into the chat there. I think we'll leave the questions there, but a question came to the chat about the association between vaping and um, lung cancer and the risk maybe relative to that of smoking. And I know there's, there's been some work done on that. And, and do you have any updates on, on what the risk factor is about with vaping? Um, I know that vaping has uh, been known to cause inflammation on blood vessels in humans. And certainly there's a strong association between inflammation and cancer development. Um, it's also, because that's one reason why you wouldn't vape it's also known, considered an opportunity lost, uh, a lost opportunity. So if somebody's thinking about quitting smoking, they should quit smoking and not take up vaping, where there's a risk that they will also slip back into smoking again. I think one of the problems with vaping is, if you think about it this way, we know the median age of diagnosis of lung cancer is 70 to 74 years. We know that the highest proportion of people who smoke are in the 18 to 24 year old group in, in, in Ireland at least. So if you think of it, for those people aged 18 to 24, it's going to take them about 50 years to develop lung cancer. Now, vaping hasn't been around for 50 years. So that long, long, long research and that bulk of evidence just isn't there yet. But I would be highly suspicious of vaping. Um, it's, a, it's a lost opportunity to quit smoking, which is not a good thing. But there is an association between vaping and inflammation in humans. And that is not a good thing. Mm. Now, Heather, yeah. I don't know if you have further updates on that. Yeah, um, and in children and adolescents as well, you know, nicotine is associated, you know, it impacts brain development. And so that, you know, if, if children and adolescents are, you know, consuming nicotine through vaping, uh, that can actually impact, you know, they could end up with kind of things like, you know, maybe learning difficulties or anxiety disorders. There's some evidence around that, certainly according to the World Health Organization. As Una said, the evidence perhaps in relation to cancer isn't quite there yet, but we know that it is harmful. And in terms of, you know, vaping as something to help people quit smoking, which I think has been posited in some jurisdictions, um, again, in order for a product to be licensed for that kind of thing, it would have to be um, approved by the Health Products Regulatory Authority. And no e-cigarette products are approved for that kind of, of use in Ireland. Um, and I think, yeah, just the overall consensus certainly from globally and from the World Health Organization is that they are harmful and they should be avoided. But yeah, in terms of their oncogenic uh, potential, like the, as, as Una said, that research I'm sure is accumulating with the evidence for harm. And, you know, we've all heard accounts of things like kind of chemical lung injury with them. So um, I think certainly the advice is, is to avoid them. Mm. Thank you. So I, I've been trying to think during the presentation this evening in terms of a community pharmacist, what our role or, or what we can do. And I think there there is a lot we can do from whether it's public health signage and messaging and, you know, engaging with um, public health campaigns around whether that's um, skin cancers or, uh, or as we move through the year, the various campaigns that are, are going on. Um, I suppose counselling around diet and lifestyle when we can intervene. Um, I think that's probably uh, something that we can readily do, especially for patients we have an established relationship, that's something. And then acting on signs and symptoms. I suppose, is there anything else you feel um, in 
terms of of kind of trying to uh, get in there with patients and and flagging risks i suppose encouraging them to go to the to the gp can be sometimes a one we can do um and it can take a few goes i think to encourage people to to go to the doctor sometimes with with symptoms is there anything else that springs to mind in terms of what community community pharmacists can do given that we encounter such a wide range of people in a day yeah, I think for me, the, one of the big things for men is the nudge, the fact that they do come to you and they do trust you and they will be coming to you in that age group and they do need a nudge. So the nudge would be very, very helpful. Um, I think it would help if you can just have your antennae up for those common symptoms. So somebody comes in and saying, oh, I'm having terrible diarrhea, just to have the antennae up for that. Or would you look at this funny mole on my arm? And I'm sure it happens and just have the antennae up. And I think perhaps mm. as well, it's just worth being able to reassure people, especially men, that this is not the end of the world, you know, an early stage cancer, you know, it can be sorted and it can be dealt with and you can get your life back on track. But you really must get onto it. You really, really must get onto it as soon as possible. Um, mm -hmm. Particularly things like melanoma. And we saw the data there for bowel cancer. You just must get onto it. And I think what's really noticeable in, in all the surveys is that people listen to their pharmacists and they trust their pharmacists. So if you say it, they'll believe you, and I think and they'll get onto it. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I think um, having those conversations and and yeah, following up with people if we see them again in terms of have they have they gone is is sometimes yeah as you say getting every opportunity we can. So thank you um, very much for um, that wide range of presentation this evening. It's it's been very helpful and I've certainly picked up a lot of new information there that I wasn't aware of. Um, so thank you Heather and Redmond and Una for for putting that together and and um, delivering it so well. Um, Audrey, if we could pull up the just the closing out slides. Um, just and also share the, the feedback link if possible for those that are still with us. So apologies going for going a few minutes over. Um, so Audrey has very kindly put the uh, feedback survey into the chat box there. So uh, any feedback on this evening's presentation or any future webinars that you would hope to see, please do uh, give us some feedback. Um, thank you very much, Pat, for that, that lovely feedback. Um, so as always, we would encourage you to complete a reflective cycle based on your learning from this evening. Um, and you can do so obviously within your ePortfolio. Um, in terms of future webinars, we will be uh, having one final uh, webinar before we close out the series for to give us a break for the summer, and that will be advertised uh, shortly through um, the usual media, through Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram, and also will uh, an advert will land into your your inbox as well. So keep an eye out for that. Um, it will be advertised in the next week or so. Okay, so thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening. And as I say, we will post the recording to the website in the coming days.